All right. Well, welcome to TEDx. I have a riddle for you. And if you know this one, don't give it away <laughs> to your neighbors. So a father and son get into a really bad car accident. The father doesn't make it. He passes away. The son is taken to the hospital for surgery. The surgeon comes into the operating room and says, I can't operate on this child. He's my son. So how is that possible? Take a few seconds amongst yourselves. You can think about it. If you find this puzzling too, actually, you're not alone. This is a hard one. So the answer is the surgeon is the boy's mother. Yeah. <laughs> so if you were stumped by this, it doesn't mean that you don't think women can be surgeons. Uh, it's just that the power of language. When we say surgeon, we think male. Language dictates our thoughts. It dictates our behaviors, our reality. Language is the basis of everything. And something really cool is happening right now. The world is creating an entire new language. You might have heard of it, a little something called AI or uh, AI large language models. Super exciting times, except some of these biases that we have in our current language are probably going to get propagated over into the AI system. So today as a physician, as an AI researcher, my one mission is to impart the thought that as we're building these large language models, that we take the opportunity to take out this bias and we code for a better future. Before I go all the way to the future, though, I want to take you guys one step back. So over 50,000 years ago, a singular event happened, and that was the creation of language. That was the spoken word, it was storytelling. And with that, we went from cavemen and cave women, because we were there too. <laughs> it took us all the way to the complex societies that we have today. And language was the basis of everything. And why language? What was the purpose of it? You might say communication. That's the obvious answer. Uh, Professor Noam Chomsky is one of our more prominent linguists of our time. He says it's actually not communication. It's to convey thought. He puts it in an interesting way. He says that as individuals, we actually spend most of the day engaging with language in our own heads, in our own thought, rather than actually communicating with other people. So it's a conduit for thought. So now these early people, they were able to storytell, tell their thoughts to their friends around them, maybe their whole town, maybe a couple of towns over. And then the next pivotal step happened, and that was the advent of the written word, because now you not only can storytell, but you can write it down. And if you can write it down, you can copy it, you can publish it, you can mass distribute ideology, so pretty powerful. But whatever the logistics happened back then, it ended up that a lot of that text was written by mostly one gender. So that created some unbalance, some down the stream, unexpected effects. And uh, Dr. Leonard Schlein, he was a Bay Area physician and a scholar. He has a really interesting theory in his book, The Alphabet and the Goddess. We know that early societies worshiped goddesses. Women had power positions as priestesses, as oracles. His theory is actually that with the written word, the goddesses start to get written out. He talks about the prominent early texts rooted in Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and how the goddesses slowly became just one god, that god became a he, uh, and then so started the patriarchal societies that we have today. And those were the old texts, but what about our new texts, right? So if we look at academics now, a lot of the textbooks are still mostly written by men, in business and management, a lot of business curriculum is written by men for men. So I want to give you guys all a term to think about and just see what thought pops up into your head. So think about executive presence. So just take 10 seconds, going to think about that. Just a picture will pop into your head. That's how our language to thoughts works. And the large majority of people might think something like this. So if, if some version of this is in your head right now, the question becomes, what linguistic definition put that thought into our head? And the answer to that actually lies in business psychology. So early business psychologists, when they were putting traits to these terms, they mostly studied male leaders. So they attached traits like competitiveness, assertiveness, aggressiveness, predominantly male traits. To, and a lot of our business terms actually have, have traits like this. But now it's a little bit of a problem. We know that there is a gender pay gap, we know we don't have enough women in the C-suite roles, and so business and academia really care about this now. How do we put women into these roles? But it's really hard. It's hard to take a woman and squeeze her into a term with a linguistic definition that's describing 
predominantly male traits. Um, so that's something I, I know intimately as a woman going through academics, leadership positions. So I've thought about this a lot. <laughs> and one of the most eye-opening moments for me, kind of my aha moment, was actually when I had my own daughter. So watching her from toddler age to age three, four, five, starting school, it was pretty obvious this is Quinn's world. The rest of us just live in it. Her speech was so confident, so precise. She embodied female executive presence. And it made me think, we're trying to teach these traits to adult women, but these little ones already have them. It's like hard-coded in them. So the question becomes, when does the executive presence get written out? And the answer to that lies in the linguistic literature. So if we look at the linguistic literature, we find time and time again, as little girls mature, their speech becomes more tentative. They start to hedge. They start to say more like maybe and I don't know, and they add a bunch of qualifiers like only and just. And this is happening around a time where they're exposed to some stereotypes as well, like the surgeon or executive presence. And it's called stereotype threat. And it can actually be dangerous because it can really lower her performance. It can decrease her confidence. It creates a whole vicious cycle. So I think you guys see where the problem <laughs> lies. And we probably see where we need to get the change in this cycle. But you might say, change is really hard. You just described hundreds of thousands of years of inbuilt bias. How, how do we unravel this? So my mission today was to tell you that with AI, it's not hard. It's actually easy, it's just a choice. AI is not bias, it's just a machine. What it puts out is what we decide to put into it. So we really have the option to kind of hack the system now. Think about the example earlier with the riddle, with the mom and the surgeon. If I told it to you now, would you guys get it right? Of course you would, right? Because we, we just told you the answer. And that's the power of AI. If you put in the right data sets, you're gonna get correct outputs. AI has turned the world on its head. In 2022, when OpenAI released ChatGPT, within five days, there were a million users. That's crazy fast adoption for technology. And within two months, there were 100 million users every month. And when they released the ChatGPT API, within five days, there were 1.5 million developers using the technology. So myself and my team were among early adopters. We built a large language model. I'm a dermatologist, so it's built on dermatology. But when we built it, we focused on building it on a diverse data set representing all genders. So when you ask it for key opinion, expert opinion now, it's gonna give you a fair distribution of female key opinion leaders and male key opinion leaders. So it's a proof of concept, but it shows that AI fairness is possible if we choose it. And if we're able to do this in a subspecialized field, what could we do if we did this at scale, right? So I have three major asks today. The first one is to our business psychologists, we need better definitions for females in the business. We need to define terms like female executive presence. And once we have those definitions, we stick those into every AI model <laughs> that we can find. The second is for the women. We need to write, write, and write for the future because our written word is what goes into these models to build out the outputs. And we should probably stop writing so much for the problems and challenges of today, even though they're really important, but if that's all we wrote, that's all that'll be propagated into the future. We need to write about our successes or achievements, define power words, and then stick that into the AI system. So let that be propagated for us, for our daughters, for the women that come after us. And then the lastly, it's to the big companies and the developers, because they're gonna make the most change. A common term we know is garbage in, garbage out. So you know, hopefully they, they take the time to take out the bias and not put in garbage <laughs> into the systems. So over 50,000 years ago, one singular event happened with advent of language. That's changed the entire trajectory of our human experience. Today is the beginning of the next evolution of language for humanity. It's gonna dictate the next hundreds of thousands of years. So the question I wanna leave everyone with is, what future are we coding? Thank you. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>